um, we would want you to be um, very uh, involved and confident in offering your volunteering services. And for that, you will need to speak with conviction and therefore you'll need to understand uh, uh, a little bit more and little in depth about how you could best, you know, encash your commitment onto this um, great forum called Bengaluru Navanirmana uh, Party. Okay. So we thank uh, Srikanth and uh, Monica and the rest of the team. And uh, uh, there were a few questions raised yesterday, which um, I promised to answer today. It was Mr. Shetty who raised uh, some very relevant um, medically related questions as well. So when I give you the case examples of the plight of what the volunteers have been going through, I will address them. So not at the very end, but somewhere in the middle. So if Mr. Shetty is already uh, on uh, the platform, uh, he can uh, just hold his patience for a little while. So uh, COVID has forced us to make our health a priority, which as per the old adage of health is wealth, should have always been the case. But now we are revisiting the fact that health is indeed the wealth jaan hai to jahan hai as uh, our prime minister said we reiterate the same point and in a few days from now when the vaccine stocks are available i urge all the volunteers from the navanirmana to create a new environment of a massive vaccination drive which would uh, get the jab into uh, every citizen about 18 years and that will be the beginning of our win. So the whole purpose of this presentation is some avenues for self-help and primarily when patients are ringing you very desperately, the family members are ringing uh, in a crisis for bed, for oxygen and for further advice to connect with the doctor, etc. You would be the primary contact point on whom they will lean on for moral support as well as the connects as well as for the right kind of information so it is very crucial that we as a volunteer group should not panic or create more chaos and create confusions we have to understand how we may guide them in a very simple manner because some of them can indeed avoid hospital admissions and some of them can delay the hospital admissions. Some of them will not get the beds and therefore they can't get into the hospital. But what can they do in the mean, meanwhile? So saving lives will be a very crucial point with some small but significant step that we as a group of volunteers would take. So when you get a call, it may be the patient uh, himself or herself saying, I have these, these symptoms. When there are symptoms, Please remember that please connect with a group of doctors. Now, I'm in conversation with the uh, Shrikanji and uh, group as to um, uh, connect with our technology partners uh, who uh, would uh, give a lead to seamless connections with the routine set of doctors who can guide them on the basics and the expert set of doctors, which are few, and therefore it needs a filter before the patients reach them, so those who really need them would reach them. So we are uh, going to be harnessing our energies in the right direction, but uh, just hold your patience for the next 48 hours when we come back to you with a helpline uh, of how we are going to stratify this. So if there are symptoms, needless to say, that you have to see to it that they connect with the doctor. The uh, caller may say that I have been tested positive, but I have no symptoms, so what shall I do next? So you have to guide uh, regarding some of the key points which are uh, very crucial, which will not allow the progression of uh, this dreaded disease. There can be a third large category. Somebody at home is positive, the others are not. So how do we deal with that? But let me place it on records that the second wave of COVID is quite different from the first wave because with all kinds of cocktail therapies and the plasma donations, etc., the virus had gone smarter and they have muted and there is a whole different infectivity pattern. Originally in the first wave, if one person in the house was positive, the other stayed a little bit away or took the basic necessary precautions, 
the others would escape out of this. But now, no longer, that's a situation where one person is positive, very, very, very likely that all the five or six of them who are staying in the same house would turn positive whether they have symptoms or not. So it's crucial that you have to give some kind of basic guidance, not only to the person who is positive, but also how the others will deal with the situation. So let's just focus on the traffic signal system. If you, with your uh, conversation and the data gathering have gathered that they will go into the green zone, which means they require only home isolation. You are going to connect them with the doctors. We will facilitate the daily teleconsultations and they are in, in a way can totally avoid the hospital administration, uh, the admissions, but the responsibility lies on the doctor with whom you connect, but you should know which are the patients whom we will uh, connect and keep giving them a moral support that they are in the green and they should remain there and uh, they will uh, really not need to seek and occupy the hospital beds unnecessarily. The amber zone where the next level where they will need a care center, where they will need the monitoring. Yes, that can be done on the teleconsultation, but they may also need an oxygen through an oxygen concentrator or oxygen cylinder, and some medications will have to be started double quick. The last and the worst of the category is you already recognize by the few things that you have gathered on the telecall that no, this patient needs absolutely an urgent and an imminent admission. And as Mr. Shetty mentioned yesterday, are they seeking help too late? Because oxygen saturation, which is the key, cannot drop suddenly with that. It must have happened over a period of few days where there was a disconnect and they could have got more tests done and they could have been alert and well been in the amber or green zone. But unfortunately, they have already landed in the red zone. He also asked about what are those tests and what do those tests mean? Because anybody and everybody just seeing the social media messages are doubling up as Dr. Google and telling everyone, oh, you got this, go and get a CT done. And everybody seems to know about RT-PCR, when it's to be done, about the CTs, about the blood tests and interpretations and misinterpretations are uh, sky high. And that is what is misguiding and creating more chaos. A vast majority of people still remember, though the second wave is highly infective, all the five, six people at home are getting infected, but most of them will be mild or asymptomatic. The ratio is about 80% asymptomatic still, even in the second wave, 10% will go to the amber and the last 10%, 5% will go on to the uh, red zone. So the green ones can be managed at home. There's no need to panic. Only a small proportion of all infected patients will need hospitalization. Volunteers are desperately seeking oxygen cylinders, oxygen concentrators from where to get, how to connect. Nobody's picking up the phone. This is the plight as on today, but who needs it? And if you don't get it, what is the simple advice that you can give them so that they can stall in the intervening period till they get the oxygen cylinder, how they have to manage? People with comorbidities and the age, this is an absolute must in your data because if those red flags are raised, Please, please, please connect to the network of doctors as early as possible before they deteriorate. Vaccination is, you know, because of the shortage, we are not able to do as much as we could have. But those who are already vaccinated really will need um, less and less um, uh, possibility that they will go into the intensive care. So if somebody in the household is infected and they make a call to you, you have on your checklist the most important risk factors. If they're more than 60, if they have diabetes, if they have hypertension, if they're obese, if they've got all other major organ diseases, it's a problem. You have to alert them that today you're okay, but please, please get in touch with the doctor and then, you know, we'll see what it was. And which doctor they have to get in touch with also is becoming a challenge because anybody is advising anything right, left and center, we confess. And we need to get uh, the trained doctors on this issue. It's not a rocket science. We are in the process of training a bunch of hundred doctors who will follow the protocols and give the correct guidance. Needless to say that that person needs to wear a mask and rest of the family members also, though they are not infected, they absolutely have to wear the mask even in their own house and try to stay away from each other as much as possible. Multiple household members can stay in the same house, but the distancing, hand washing, all those protocols have to be absolutely followed. 
And if there is an elderly at home who is positive and you are the one who are taking care of that elderly, not only the mask, but if the plastic sheet like a visor, where, which the doctors and the nurses in the hospitals wear, if you can get hold of that, that's an ideal gear to wear because your eyes, nose and mouth is covered with that plastic shield and you are getting close to that patient, please hand hygiene you maintain and maintain a minimum contact time with that elderly in your house or uh, husband or spouse or anybody who you would be primarily giving them food or water or uh, just helping them with the small course, uh, then you need to protect yourself as well. Uh, then when you say isolation, Again, not to move out for work or shopping. Anyhow, the uh, chief minister has announced a lockdown, so there's no question of a great shopping. But just taking a stroll in the apartment complex, going out for exercises, etc., is a complete no-no because this is now declared by WHO as airborne. So you will be responsible for just becoming a super spreader. Please, please avoid that. And if anybody is at your door, let them knock the door or ring the bell and leave the items on the doorstep and then step back and then you pick up the parcel. These simple things have to be followed. And when you guide the patients, please tell them that oxygen saturation is the most important thing. And they cannot just get a symptom for an oxygen saturation. They have to use a pulse oxygenator. So there is a package that... You know, it's available in many places, but uh, from BNP also, we can just facilitate because Amazon people are in touch with us and uh, we will make a neat package of what really says it is. The ones who are selling it in other parts of the country, they have a pulse oximeter, thermometer, a sanitizer, a mask and uh, uh, the COVID symptom monitoring chart, a visor, etc. So minimal things which are required. So if there is a positivity, the key thing is to check the oxygen saturation. So they can't do it without a pulse oximeter. So digital BP apparatus, many people may have. Glucometer to check diabetes, many people may have. But pulse oximeter, now many people have started having. But those who are in Europe, you make sure that they, that's the least that they must have. And what else you should do? Today, they may have no symptoms, but you have to keep monitoring. Because remember, the first five days is the incubation. They have the virus within them, but the symptoms will take a while to manifest and get out there to give you a, a proper clue. So they have to, the first two days, no symptoms. The fifth, sixth day may be worse, or they may be running fever for the, all the eight days, and that is a more serious condition. So in the initial data, whether they're 60 plus, whether it's a female patient and pregnant, because then again, our group of specialists have to come into the picture. The days since the symptoms have started, if it's eight-day fever, it means quite different from the two-day fever whether they have already got the RT-PCR test done or maybe at this point in time, they may have no symptoms and they may get away without having any symptoms um, uh, even in the future. That is called asymptomatic. They are infected, but they are not in any kind of trouble. So fever, fatigue, shortness of breath and drowsiness. You know, somehow if you're very lethargic and you know, were, um, you know the parents of a child were spanking the child saying that you're not attending your online classes, you all the time are lazy, you seem to be sleeping. And after two, three days, um, they recognize that it is the COVID positivity which is making the child drowsy. So all age groups are now in the second wave are uh, getting affected. The third wave is likely uh, predicted even worse. So be alert on these kind of symptoms. If anybody is at home and complaining of that, that is also a symptom that you need to pick. So when you get an opportunity, to speak to one member of the family who is calling, please recognize that their head is not on their shoulders because they are in a panic mode. They don't know what to do next. So you just tap the information about all other members in the family on these lines and guide them that they have to, if they have symptoms, they have to get in touch with the doctor. Otherwise, they have to at least make a note of what is what. And a list of comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, previous cardiac disease, already uh, repeatedly getting respiratory infants, all those go into the uh, high-risk zone. And so the basic thing, the hallmark for this is oxygen saturation. Please do recognize that the nose, mouth, and lungs, that is the track of the COVID-19 uh, virus entry. So by the time it reaches the lungs and the uh, oxygenation is less than 90 
94 percent they have to take a walk even if it is fine before the walk after the walk that means when you exercise your lungs need to supply the tissues with more oxygen so after a three to six minute walk if the oxygen saturation drops that is the earliest clue that you will get that if the viral load increases if more amount of the lung is affected within two to four days even at rest the oxygen saturation is going to drop so that is the key so use of the pulse oximeter is absolutely absolutely the basic um, you know uh, educational drive if i may call it that the volunteers should do and please ask them to walk for three to six minutes and re-monitor so that you won't miss the early cases and the uh, pulse rate also is to be monitored whether they're gasping for breath if the patient himself or herself is talking and whether the uh, relative reports that they uh, cannot complete the full sentence without a pause, they're pausing like that. That means they don't have any oxygen, they don't have any energy. They're in a desperate situation already and difficult to arouse from sleep because the brain has no oxygenation means they will be very, very drowsy. So these things have to be noted. A must ensure, please send them a screenshot that they have to do this and they have to, we may also create a whole team of nurse practitioners who may just monitor whether all of these are okay and then raise a red flag when these are not okay. So the pulse oximeter, the digital BP apparatus, the thermometer, all that you're given them in the package will come very handy, but they have to note this. Check the temperature every six hours, measure how many times they're breathing per minute. It's okay even if it's up to 25, though the normal is 12 to 16. Again, I'm coming back to the point that oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter is really a must. Amazon, Flipkart, anybody would give it. No nail polish to be used. Reading for one minute and don't move the fingers when you're hooked onto the um, uh, pulse oximeter. What is the principle of this weather? Again, we go to the traffic signal. Red, amber, green. If it's more than 95, well, they are in the green zone. And this is how the pulse oximeter shows. SpO2 is oxygen saturation. More than 95, yeah, they're green and you can also relax. But today they're green, tomorrow they may become amber or uh, red. So make sure they have taken the reading again after the three to six minute walk and this is not dropping. And make sure that day after day after day for about two weeks time, the oxygen saturation remains good. So they remain in the green zone. If it's anywhere between 91 to 94, they need to be pumped up with oxygen. This is the second category, COVID care beds with supply of oxygen and maybe some medicines when the doctor uh, prescribes them. Less than 90, already it is the uh, alert sign and on the pulse oximeter, you will see this big reading here, that is the oxygen saturation. The smaller one here is the pulse rate, which I said should not cross about 120 and the graph um, comes in the rest of the uh, area that is uh, here and uh, this is the way they will hook on to the pulse oximeter. If you have a video call, you can even show it to them and uh, the uh, fact that they should record it properly. If they move their fingers, it will sometimes go to 95, sometimes 90 and they will panic. The mental status is very important. Uh, as somebody yesterday also commented, the immune status is going down because they are so worked up and uh, they cannot uh, you know, fight the thoughts within themselves. So please see that they do the correct things at the correct time. And this is how we expect the patients to record. Even in a notebook, even in a pencil, they're writing and they're sending us the screenshots of the time in which they've taken, the temperature, the pulse, the respiration, the BP, the oxygen saturation, after walking, how much it was, etc., etc. So this is a, absolutely a must. The question about the housemaids and the drivers. Yeah, if the housemaid is staying within your house, she is like any other household member. So that is fine. If Then she has to take the same precautions anyway. But outside maid is coming. She is going to four other houses. She may carry the infection from anywhere she must not be allowed to enter the house without a mask. And all of you should quickly wear the mask when she enters and also stay in a separate room when she's cleaning the other room. These small practical points are very, very, very important. And ask her also to maintain the hand hygiene. And without the maids, it's fine, but you know, many of us are not used to doing the household chores or, and also uh, the elderly who cannot manage without the maids, you have to let them in, but these two precautions have to be absolutely followed.
uh, these are the kind of packages that they are offering uh, in the other parts of the country and in even in some parts of uh, Bengaluru. Many of the corporate hospitals have tied up to the hotels where they give the video consultation and the medicines are delivered at the doorstep and the blood samples are collected and uh, they uh, reach the further advice also. So most of the things which can be done digitally as how we are conversing with each other today on the digital platform let's exploit the technology to its maximum and see to it that connectivity is there digitally but not physically and that is safe in and in the interest of everybody now coming to the key questions that were raised yesterday everybody is talking about rtpcr yes that still even today remains the gold standard if RT-PCR is positive, it is positive. But if RT-PCR is negative, three out of 10 who actually have the virus in their body will still report negative. That's called false negative. It's negative, but it's a false report. That is an inherent problem in the way that the RT-PCRs are done. But if it's positive, it's 100% positive. It cannot come positive without the virus being in the system. But if it's negative, well, the virus could be there, but still it may belong to the 30% So out of every 10 RT-PCRs that you have, seven who are positive are pakka positive. The three who are negative may be positive, but may be negative also. So false uh, negativity is, uh, is a given, but false positivity is not. So RT-PCR is a gold standard test. If anybody has got the RT-PCR done, even in the first five days, when they don't have any symptoms, when the virus has just gotten in there, in the incubation period, also the RT-PCR will be positive. But this is not rocket science, so I need my listeners to pay really an attention to this. I said from the nose to mouth to lungs. So the very first day or second day, the patient is ringing you up, saying my RT-PCR is positive, then you become the doctor and you say, oh, is it? Let's see if your lungs are affected. Go get a CT done. Okay. At self-request also, CT is being done in many places. General practitioners are requesting. Many medical practitioners who still need the awareness are requesting because they think, oh, this is affecting the lungs. So let's see your CT. If it's not affected your lungs, don't worry. Okay. So the second day the CT is done. Has the virus reached the lungs yet? Has it damaged the lungs? Does the CT show any changes? No. Second, third, fourth day, it will not show any changes. So fifth to seventh day, that is the zone where the lungs will start getting impacted. So many patients, what they're doing, they're getting the CT done too early. And then, you know, keeping it under the pillow and saying, hey, my CT is okay. That means my lungs are fine. I have no danger at all. And they're very, very complacent. They're asymptomatic. By, by the fifth, sixth, seventh day, zoop, the oxygen saturation drops because that's when the lungs are affected. They have done the CT too early and they have missed the bus. So this is the ground reality and situation. And the scores of the uh, CT, if it's more than 15, it's a very severe case. Large part of the lung is affected. Surely their oxygen saturation will be less and they need a lot of help. Whereas it's the ultra case in RT-PCR. The viral load is very, very high if the readings are low. But let's not get into too much of that. If they've got the RT-PCR and it's positive, then you need to be on double alert. If it's negative, also you need to be on the alert because... Uh, it may be a false uh, negative. Whereas CT report, if they present to you, please don't go by the CT report alone because unless it's done under medical supervision. In fact, the patient who is not having the high viral load may pick up a greater viral load by getting under the CT machine, which is you know being done for so many of the really infected patients. So let's not encourage the wrong trend. Two other things. This may look complicated, but actually it's quite simple. Because some of the patients who will ring you up may say, oh, no, but uh, you know, my uh, CRP is this and uh, IL-6 is this. What are these? What is the CRPF is police force. CRP is something which is a marker for inflammation. So this whole thing is infection, inflammation. If your body wants to fight the COVID-19, what it has to do? It has to produce tons of CRP. So if CRP is more than 100, your body is fighting it out. 
That means there's a huge viral load. The battlefield is big. Soldiers are many and they have to fight it out. So CRP is more means the patient is in more trouble. Same with IL-6. IL-6 is again an inflammatory marker. If IL-6 is more than 100, that means next workforce has been signaled by the body to fight the COVID. That means more number of soldiers are coming in, which means the viral load is more and they're fighting it out. So CRP being more, IL-6 being more, that category, even the oxygen saturation is not fallen yet. They are likely to have a fall. They are likely to get into ICU. Please start advising them to start looking for the beds. Maybe you may not advise, but you have to at least recognize that you have to put them in touch with the doctor quickly. Not everybody needs a doctor consultation, but these people will definitely need. So let me give you two case examples from our own volunteers. Uh, this is Arjit who had sent me this case saying, um, age is 75. So we have raised the red flag. Consciousness level is reduced. Another red flag. Extreme weakness, stammering. He cannot complete a sentence. Problem. SpO2, oxygen saturation is 65 or below. Again, very, very big red flag. Has he got the COVID test? Yes, obviously you would expect that it is positive. So it is positive. Does he have other issues in his body which does not help him to fight? He has BP. He has sugar. He has heart condition. Then what to do? It's anybody's guess that he will urgently need a ICU bed. But the question that was raised yesterday, can this all happen all of a sudden? I would say a strict no. There has been a delay in seeking help. There has been a delay in instituting the treatment. And therefore, the deterioration has happened. It can happen rapidly. It can happen slowly. But at the first point, if you pick up, then it's the ideal thing to do. But the uh, question about the steroids, etc., I'll come to it in the next case. So this is what we are re-emphasizing. Home isolation, be confident, everything okay. But the charts and the daily teleconsultations is a must. If we can get our volunteer workforce to double up for this green zone, which means 8 out of 10 patients, which means 80% of the patients, the volunteers are hand-holding, helping, and it's a great service that you would be doing. Starting to look for oxygen concentrators and oxygen beds, yes, that is the next step. Uh, 10 to 15%, that also is a lot of help. But the last 5%, please recognize our limitations as a BNP group because we don't own a hospital. We don't have the liberty to block the beds just for nothing. And when a desperate patient seeks help, yes, we are trying our best. It's a moral responsibility, but we cannot set the expectations that we will anyhow get you the bed because it is 30 beds available and 300 patients waiting in the queue. So by the time this patient deteriorates, he may be the 500th patient waiting in the queue. So you need to be very careful about that 5%. The 5% today is filling up our WhatsApp group at the maximum. But please recognize, as Shrikanji said, glass half full and half empty. Behind these desperate messages which are coming through the volunteers in our WhatsApp group, there are many, many who have been helped by our volunteer group. So let's pat our back for that 90% of the help that we have done. Keep your motivation on. Keep going. Lagera Ho principle is what you have to follow because you are not only helping that patient, but please find out about the other family members and guide them appropriately. This is another <coughs> package that many hospitals... See, like Spush Hospital is a big hospital which is tied up with the hotel. Lalit Ashok Hotel is tied up with the Apollo group. So you can probably channelize the patient through Apollo. They will guide them to uh, uh, stay in a hotel for two reasons. One is they have a small house. They reported positive. Elderly parents are there. They cannot stay at home. They want to isolate themselves. So they go to this hotel. In the hotel, what happens? Somebody is visiting. One doctor is visiting every day or teleconsulting. All their vitals are being checked. Oxygen saturation is being checked. Nurses there stations for any emergency. 
sanitation is ensured, isolated bed is there, food is available, hotels to ready. So these kind of packages are now, you know, there will be an affordable class, even the middle class will stretch a little bit and afford, but we should also help them in giving this kind of information because more and more corporate hospitals and also the connect with the corporate through the government beds are also happening in this chain of hotel as a hospitality industry and hospital as a medical care industries marrying together to help the patient. And so this is another example of Lalita Shop and well, single occupancy at 6,000 per day, etc. with all these included. But here also remember the monitoring is a must. If they can do it at home, well and good. If they can't, if they want to isolate in the hotel, that's another option available because here they're offering oxygen concentrators and cylinders as well. So if you recognize in your traffic signal system that yes, they're in the amber zone, ICU beds are not available, but they don't need the ICU. You can connect them through the uh, hospital to the hotel so that the loop is tied and the patient again comes back to their own home in the rest of their health. So this is again, this is a busy slide, but I have purposely put it because to give you an example, age is 66. So all of you will raise your hands and say, no, age is a problem, right? Then the COVID result is positive. Symptoms, since when? Since about eight days, when this patient has got in touch with us. From 28th April, they're having problem, but they have gotten in touch only on the 4th of May. Saturation levels are now dropped to 70. Patient already knew with BP and uh, diabetes. Patient is an oxygen cylinder? Yes. Now they require the ICU. They're searching for beds since uh, about three, four days, but not available anywhere. That is the reality. So uh, coming to Mr. Shetty's uh, question, uh, I hope uh, I have been clear enough to say any symptoms refer to the doctor. RT-PCR positive, take it on face value, but RT-PCR negative, still be guarded. Don't reassure that, okay, RT-PCR is negative, nothing will happen because it may be false uh, negative. Third thing is, if they've got the CT done very early or you don't take the liberty of just asking for CT right, left and center, that is not going to be useful. If some blood records already the patient is having, please refer to the doctor so it can be interpreted properly. There was a question about steroids. At home also, nebulization of steroids. The steroids, when they're given is, when there is something called a cytokine storm. And what is a cytokine storm? I said the warriors are put into the battlefield to fight the virus. So there is a storm of the IL-6, CRP, everybody coming into your system. And that storm needs to be abated with the steroids. So that has to be the right medicine has to be given at the right time. And it's usually given for a short duration because you endlessly keep giving steroids, you will develop infections because of the prolonged use of steroids itself. And oxygenation has a very significant role because you need to plug the oxygen deficit. LNWH is low molecular weight heat bag. Many patients are guided to take this again because all the cloths sitting in the, um, uh, you know, balloons within your own lung, they are the ones who are blocking the uh, lungs and not allowing uh, the oxygenation to ha uh, happen properly. Somehow, uh, remdesivir has become very popular, but let me tell you emphatically that it, it too has a limited role. When it has to be given and to whom it has to be given, if you get a request for that, you may need to take a second opinion, connect the patient to the key doctor, which we are going to establish that system very soon. They will tell whether, whether remdesivir or just looking for remdesivir aimlessly is not the answer. And please remember the silent disease for seven days where the patient has not even monitored oxygen saturation, suddenly he collapses. Day before yesterday, oxygen saturation was 90. You could have done something about it. It was 85. You could have still done something about it. But nobody has seen. Neither you nor the patient nor anybody. And by seventh day, eighth day, a rapid deterioration happens. And then they come on to our network and ask for ICU beds, which is the last and the last 5%. That is like really, really pathetic because we have missed the bus. So please remember... Asymptomatic phase is the first five days. The first seven days is called the window period. Right from 
day zero when the patient doesn't have any symptoms, fifth, sixth, seventh day, they start developing symptoms. In both these cases, RT-PCR is the only test which is the gold standard. If it's positive, it's positive. Then two weeks later, there's a decline phase. And at the end of four weeks only, the patient will start becoming, you know, not uh, really infecting uh, the others. So this whole course needs to be done. Some general advice, which you must not miss your opportunity to give them this general advice. Please ask them to take plenty of water, checking the temperature and not allowing the temperature to cross 100. If they cross 100, anybody with common sense will give them a crocin, a paracetamol, because high temperatures, high cytokine storm, blasting and, you know, making the whole situation very dangerous is not to be allowed. Persistent fever is dangerous. So please, uh, you can tell them to take plenty of hydration and tea, coffee, water, juice, whatever they like. And uh, they have to monitor the urine color. If it's dark, that means they need to increase their uh, fluids. Not to go out for exercises, but at home only, walk around the house, pranayama, whatever they want to do. Because breathing exercises really help a lot and they have to get adequate. One simple common sense advice, which I want each and every volunteer to proactively raise this topic and speak to people about the positioning. If they are well enough to sit down, they have to lean forward and sit so that more oxygen goes to the back of the lungs or the base of the lungs. And if they are lying down, let them lie down full time in the prone position because it significantly improves the oxygenation to the lung. Every two hours, they have to change the position, let them lie down on the side, let them lie down uh, in uh, over their stomach. And this is the way they can place a pillow on, under their chest. And even pregnant women, we ask them to lie down ulta with a uh, pillow on their uh, tummy as well. This ulta pulta position is required only when their pulse oximeter shows that the Oxygen saturation is less than 95. Simply with them, when they're doing good, with oxygen saturation is more than 95, 96, let them walk around. Let them not all the time be lying down. That's not a good thing to do. So the amber, 90 to 95, 86 to 95, that is the zone where till they get the oxygen cylinder, till they get the bed, till they get help, this position significantly improves. Two days, you may not get the oxygen cylinder. Third day, you're seeing the pulse ox is already showing you 94 plus. Then, you know, the, uh, the scale of the disease has not been too much and they have already uh, recovered. There are doubts between oxygen cylinder and oxygen concentrator. Both will supply oxygen, so both are good. The oxygen cylinder, if it gets empty, you need to replace it. Oxygen concentrators, many apartment complexes, we are toying with the idea of guiding them to buy two oxygen cylinders like the swimming pool facility, like the gym facility, the day will come and it's not very far away. But this apartment complex has two oxygen concentrators and this facility is available here. So any apartment reports that they need an oxygen cylinder uh, or an oxygen concentrator, it goes there on rental basis. And then once a the patient gets well, then it can be shifted on. Yeah, this oxygen concentrator works only on electricity and it is to be charged and it, it will uh, drive 5 liters, 10 liters uh, oxygen. So it's a uh, it's a via media. Uh, and whenever the oxygen cylinders, nowadays they're keeping at home also, they're not aware, they will pray and keep the via or the lamp also. They're highly combustible. You're providing oxygen cylinders and you're not guiding them to, uh, you know, take care uh, of the environment around that oxygen cylinder. It can lead to more danger. So you, uh, please tell them that oxygen does support combustion and cause fire. Keep it away from the kitchen. Keep it away from the candle flame or dia or no sco smoke is allowed in that uh, room. Even the smoking is not allowed because that's dangerous. So if the oxygen saturation is below 94, especially after walking, if it's below 94, then extra supply of oxygen is needed because the lungs are. And please remember. Within two, three minutes after giving the oxygen, the improvement has to happen. And it does happen. And even in the prone position, the patient will recognize, hey, it was just borderline 92, but they're lying down prone, it's becoming 96. Very, very good, very well taken. So you must give this simple advice for sure. The lastly, it's the COVID-19 virus, which is saying, beat me if we can. And we say, yes, we will, and we can, because the... Vaccination drive is around the corner. Again, we want 
all our volunteers to gear up and help us in the mass vaccination drive. We are trying to get the uh, procurement um, on a bulk basis and uh, we will uh, soon uh, we'll be sharing with you uh, when that's going to be available. But when it is available, let's do our best to get the jab into everybody who is eligible and who deserves it. So this is the first phase. 14 crore people have been vaccinated, which means the minimum su uh, supply that we will need is another 14 crore for the second jab that these have to get. And really the production is not matching uh, the uh, demand. Lastly, I close with this slide, the next generation, please help us that they look back and thank us for joining hands with BNP, with the volunteers, with the hospitality industry, as in the hotels and the supplies which are uh, coming to our rescue in the step down system, the yellow and the green zone, and of course the healthcare providers who are the warriors ever ready to fight this. And this crown somehow seems to depict the very pattern of the uh, COVID uh, 19 virus. So I have chosen this picture, and there is a a uh, lot that is uh, happening and a lot that needs to be uh, known. But the uh, point is that it is not a rocket science. Most of you, if you apply your mind a little bit, pay attention to details when you're conversing as a volunteer with whomsoever you're conversing. Please don't escalate their panic by you yourself getting more panicky. Just guide them to specifically tell about other members at home as well, because you would be uh, expanding the own scope of your voluntary help to the rest of them in a very proactive manner. So I do hope on my second appearance, I've made some more things clear to uh, uh, many of uh, uh, the, um, the friends and uh, volunteers and uh, viewers here. Uh, we are always available at your service, but there is only a little that each of us uh, can do. So we are gathering a group together to um, escalate our efforts, to enhance our efforts, to make it more meaningful and to make it more scalable to reach as many as possible. And the intent of Shrikanji, Monika, Nisha, Saumya, Jyotsna, um, Shetty, uh, Prasanna, and everybody whom we have talked to in the last uh, few days, uh, we have uh, really been impressed by the very strong motivation and intent that even if we can do little, we will look back with satisfaction that we have done our bit in this great challenge that the whole world is facing. Namaskar, and thank you very much. And Monica, uh, over to you to raise the questions. Uh, yeah. So if you ask the questions out, uh, I will be happy to answer them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Hima. That was immensely useful. Lots of questions, actually. So what I'll do is uh, just some questions were asked yesterday as well as today. So I'll just mention them to you. Uh, one important question, and we'll have to go really quickly request to all the participants who we unmute to just keep the questions brief as well, because there are many questions. So one question uh, many are asking Dr. Hema is that, what is the maximum gap between two vaccine doses? So because uh, vaccines are not available now, so for the second dose, what is the maximum they can go with? Okay, I will give you a true answer that yes. uh, we don't know actually what should be the gap, but the guess is that four to six weeks should be the ideal gap, mm. even as late as eight to 10 weeks is okay. And it looks like because there's a dearth for vaccine supplies, it will by default be eight to 10 weeks, but uh, which is okay. And even one jab, even those who have had the first dose are definitely more uh, protected and less infective uh, than those who have not got vaccinated. So those uh, who are above 60 and missed the bus, those who are above 45 and missed the bus on the first circuit, really, um, you know, it's a missed opportunity, but the next round of supplies, slowly, steadily, they are coming in, but uh, let vaccine hesitancy not come in the way. Yeah. Four weeks is earlier, six to eight weeks is generally. Okay. So both for co-vaccine and COVID shield. 
um, yes, both because you know the whole world is just doing it by guesswork. The second dose is called the booster dose. Uh -huh. It is to recall the memory of your immune system. Hey, you get geared up in case this virus and the mutants come, be ready to fight. That's what the vaccines are telling them. Okay, great. And some are asking if they can, uh, how do, who, who do they call to have vaccination drives in their apartments? Is there a number that we can share with them? Uh, no, actually, as per our information, uh, we are in conversation both with the government and the manufacturers because we need at least about uh, 5 lakh doses per month. So we place order for 2 million doses uh, in three cities in the country, but we are unlikely to get it uh, in the next three weeks. Three weeks is the earliest that they have uh, promised, but uh, you know we have to hold on. That's why I was saying, Shri Kanji, let's put our implementation plan in place because yeah. many, many small hospitals, which are non-COVID hospitals, should double up as a vaccine centers because people confidently can step into those centers, finish their vaccine quickly and go home and they're non-COVID. So their minds are also a little comfortable, but slowly after yeah. this crystallizes, we'll start going to the apartments, colleges when they open up and uh, maybe other common places where we can, we should not gather too many people. That's also, you know, an issue, but there is a lot of scope to organize ourselves and uh, make this drive a reality. Okay, great. Thank you. The other, a lot of them are asking if they can have uh, access to the presentation that you just shared to look at the chart. I will, I will put it on the group. Yeah, yes. That's yeah. It. Mm -hmm. uh, I will just ask, unmute Gopal Krishna. He has uh, raised his hand long back. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, Gopal Krishna, you can ask your question, please. Uh, hello, doctor. Good morning. Namaskar. Namaskara. Uh, Madam, if you have asthma patients, do they have a vaccination? Yes, they have a vaccination. They have a vaccination. They have a vaccination. They have a vaccination. They have a protection. They have a vaccination. 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 But at this time, all the customers are or ge, ah, you know, so all passivity are taking better. Can I, ah, idul sikolala, madam. Bedsu, idalala siko kasta ra vaga. This time, all the world was in a. Ah, ah, mella. This vaga, sikka taksha niyam COVID apple register man beko. Tumba kyu ide? Adakhe nimge this vaga, a bed situation all ease ago, ashtrakte nim kaiyali dimag ago, ankul ago, thara dosi ke. Adakhe this vaga, this thara idyalala na naamel vaccine tagol thini anta niyam register man be idre. You will miss your position in the queue. Yakandre Sumar and the Nalak Laksha Jana already vaccine in the Dare Adre Namatra, one the Laksha vaccine could I with the supply illa. Ashtu gap ide Adreli, Ashton the gap ide Adrinda, other government is a Mulkani, Ivaka Tarsta, other private players could a vaccine manufacturer Satra director supply a pay the way. First of all, government is not going to be able to get the government. That's why you have to get the time to get the time. That's why you have to get the patient and get the patient. Thank you. 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 Is muted. I think it is Madam Pushpa Shinivas. Oh, is it? The better half of Dr. Shinivas. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, someone from Rotary Bangalore, uh, RT Nagar uh, is, yeah, I'll just. Uh, yes. Good morning, Doctor. Thanks for no, listening. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Satya Narayanan. I took my first jab on uh, 3rd of April, uh, mm -hmm. but I was uh, tested positive as on 1st of May. Uh, everything is fine. I'm recovering well and I completed the medication under guidance of my doctor. Mm -hmm. Now, my wife was with me for uh, almost 36 hours when I was tested positive. Though she moved out, uh, we did not want to take a chance. So we took the second RT-PCR and uh, confirmed as positive. Uh, she had her uh, both the vaccinations. Second one was taken on uh, 23rd uh, of, uh, uh, sorry, my apologies, 26th of April, mm -hmm. uh, the second one. And uh, now she is positive. Though her uh, SPO 
CO2 as well as uh, temperature is all under control. Uh, we are doing pranayama breathing exercise very religiously Excellent. and very positive. Mm. Uh, being diabetic, uh, there is a little bit of a worry. Uh, so if you can just guide us, doctor. Yeah, that's what, right? This, uh, luckily, because uh, the vaccination jab, even that one child is protective, as I told you, and she's already finished her two doses. So uh, the uh, course of uh, the disease itself, you yourself said that the oxygenation and uh, the temperature being normal, the infective status remains for about 28 to 30 days. So till then, you know, to recover from the fatigue, from the, um, uh, you know, the basic, some meager symptoms that you're not feeling all that okay and uh, that will be there but that is not of a serious concern because it is not uh, going to drive you uh, any further downhill so so far so good please continue to hydrate yourself the pranayama etc should continue but another two weeks to wait uh, before and then also the masking the hand washing social distancing is a must even for the vaccinated even she comes back home, then the same uh, precautions need to be taken for uh, at least another two weeks to three weeks. Yeah. But then you are well on the uh, on the green, so uh, the worst is over. Uh, uh, I can't recall the name. Rotary, Rotary Satyanarayana, Aarti Nagar, yeah? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, the worst is over. So I, I think you're, uh, you're uh, uh, on the other side of the... Thanks, thank, yeah. you. Th thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, Saroj, I think you had a question. Saroj? Saroj has to unmute. Saroj Sinha? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, she has to. Okay, okay. I unmuted. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I was just asking. Uh, my mother got positive. She is, mm -hmm. uh, I think, 68. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but she has not taken vaccination. Can uh, she take a vaccine? Uh, it is uh, uh, from the date that she was recorded positive. At least we have to wait for eight to nine weeks before she can take the uh, jab. So oh. in any case, I said, you know, all these problems will ease out because there are no vaccines uh, now available. So she has to wait for a while. Just check with your doctor again, because if she's just recently tested positive, then uh, about a nine weeks gap has to be given before she takes the vaccination. Huh. And one more thing, ma'am. Everyone is uh, telling, I am listening like that. Hmm. If uh, somebody is taking co-shield in first time, they have to take co in, uh, in other time because uh, both will give a uh, different, different effect. Is that no. a... No, no. The, the dictum is that, um, uh, you know, it, it is uh, said that coaxin will cover the mutants and the larger family of COVID-19. Okay. But uh, the one who's taken uh, one make, uh, if the second time also they take the same, it's fine. Second time, that is not available because some people from Hyderabad, for example, have moved into Bangalore and Bangalore is only giving COVID shield. It's okay if they take COVID shield also. It is on the principle, the vaccines, please remember everybody, it is on the principle of something better than nothing. That is okay. what is the status of vaccination is now because 70 to 80 percent protection is also considered as a very good protection because you will not go into the red zone and as long as you don't go into the red you can win the game uh, one more news is coming no ma'am that uh, san sanitize something that nasal spray mm -hmm. uh, uh, is uh, is that is also good Wow. No, the, the steroid nasal spray is uh, strictly as per the doctor's uh, advice because that has to be given in that window period of the cytokine storm, which I mentioned. So that has to be a doctor's decision. And please do not start using the wrong things at the wrong time. The whole key for the management of COVID is the right medication in the right doses at the right time. And that is a mix and match for every individual patient. Therefore, it needs a, a specialist doctor's service. Say like if I'm a routine OBGYN, I'm not interested in COVID, I cannot even treat that because I need that special know-how and training of the latest protocols which are changing by the minute we need. So if the, you know, sometimes they said this is good, then they revise saying this is not so good, then they said this should never be given. All those mix and matches happening in the scientific world as well. So please don't go ahead, except hydration, paracetamols, 
and uh, the exercises that is entirely you are licensed for this but not more than that because if you can't get in touch with your doctor and you are spiking high fever absolutely it will be advisable to take a paracetamol and get the fever down that is really crucial but beyond this you need the advice of the doctor because you yeah. should not give the steroids uh, nebulizer at the wrong time yeah thank you doctor and uh, in fact to all the attendees as well uh, there are many questions that different people may have uh, you can talk to your doctor or reach out to bnp bnp has a doctor panel and they'll connect you to a doctor panel if you need advice uh, dr hema how much time do you have because there are lots of questions coming uh, no, up no no today i, I have <laughs> time and like yesterday we were as hard pressed for time okay. uh, I, i will be happy to take some more questions. okay i think uh, let uh, imran uh, if you could unmute yourself and yeah uh, hello doctor thanks for the session uh, uh, doctor i just wanted to know with regard to the kits basically uh, is this is, is it, it is the same protocol or uh, there is a variation uh, means enagodandre madanalle makkuluge ivaga jwara bandre so we get uh, tens days so what exactly is to be followed or go it is the same we need to check with in the oximeter with the oximeter and the same levels are uh, there is a difference anta avare symptom iddoru matra doctors hatra connect aagle beku imran doctors hatra connect aagle beku yakandre jwarakke nana tara karana irutte you bari oximeter alli nodkondu adu chanagide anta ankondu adu jwara berene enadru dengue nu irbodu inne enadru irbodu adu lungs ka effect madide irbodu inne adu system ka effect madabodu thumba adu hange neglect madodu thumba risky agutte yakandre the whole world is not affected only with covid there are other non covid diseases also which give rise to fever even things like malaria fever if you don't treat it correctly ad problem e aagi kutkolade adike mostly makkalige respiratory infection nam deshal antu ela bartane irutte but adinna we doctor hatra kelli adu paracetamol syrup kododralli tappe illa jwara illiyate jwara yav kaaranadinda bandide idu covid anta nam thalinalli kutkon bittirodrinda maguge covid indane jwara bandide anta nan helakagalla alva so then the specialist will decide what are the tests has to be done maybe it's a fever due to some other cause how it has to be treated uh, suspicion of course will be very very high because what is the most common thing happening around us adane now first nam drushtinalli itkoltivi when the season anta irathalla this is the covid season that is high on the list but bere kaaranagalu ella odogalvalla covid bandirodrinda bere illa anta heng heltira so we need children ge inna solpa idu care tagolode uttama yaru ella yen aagta ide andre nam covid bandibitta kashta test madidre el positive bandibidatto anta hedrukonde idrukondo ನಾಲ್ಕು ದಿವಸ ಆರು ದಿವಸ ಲೇಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೋತಾ ಇದಾರಲ್ಲ ಅವರು ತುಂಬಾ ತೊಂದರೆಗೆ ಸಿಕ್ಕಾಕೋತಾ ಇದಾರೆ ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ದ ರಶ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಆರ್ ಟಿ ಪಿ ಸಿ ಆರ್ ಇಸ್ ಹ್ಯೂಜ್ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಒಂದು ದಿವಸದಲ್ಲಿ ರಿಪೋರ್ಟ್ ಸಿಗ್ತಾ ಇತ್ತು ಮುಂಚೆ ಈಗ ನಾವೇ ಐದ್ ದಿವಸ ವೆಯ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕಾಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಸೆಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಟು ಅ ಸೆಂಟ್ರಲೈಸ್ ಲ್ಯಾಬ್ ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ಎಲ್ಲಾ ಕಡೆಯಿಂದ ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ಅಷ್ಟು ಲಕ್ಷಾಂತರ ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ಗಳು ಬಂದು ಕೂತ್ಕೋತಾ ಇದೆ ಸೊ ಯು ರಿಯಲಿ ನೀಡ್ ಟು ವರ್ಕ್ ಯುವರ್ ವೇ ಅರ್ಲಿ ಅಂತಾನೆ ನಾನು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಶಾ thank you dr hema hema uh, just i will just uh, jyotsna uh, ask you think okay she's not there ashwika jyotishree uh, i think oh jyotishree Jyotishri. yeah jyotishree are you there uh, yes am i audible yes. yes yes okay hi doctor very information uh, informative session ma'am thank you and um, i have uh, this is my my case i had some sounds like cough uh, and uh, i lost taste, taste and smell mm-hmm. but my rt pcr report was negative uh, so when i showed to my doctor he continued the same general medicines like uh, uh, colpol doxy and all and i mm-hmm. took that a couple of more days so i'm fine now uh, i also took home medications but i have doubt that what is the probability that i will get infected again that's my first question and second question is about the vaccination when am i eligible to take vaccination because as per the guidelines if a person is uh, infected we are not supposed to take vaccination immediately right yes so, yes yeah. that was a question that somebody else raised also 8 to 9 weeks gap you must give so jyoti you are in the 30% group of false negative uh, rt pcr so rt pcr came negative but the loss of smell what you have said that's a very key symptom so nowadays what we are looking at as doctors is if any of the symptoms which are very classic for 
uh, the COVID-19. See, fever can be, as I've just explained to Imran, they can be, or Saroj, they can be due to other reasons. But loss of smell, etc., suddenly happening to uh, Eng, uh, uh, adult, it is a, a strange thing, and uh, COVID-19 is the most likely uh, cause. So even if your RT-PCR is negative, that's why the doctor has put you on doxy and uh, other drugs, which are typically the treatment for a COVID-19 infection. So you're right in presuming that you were infected, you had some symptoms, but your test came negative, but now you're well, so you've recovered. So eight to nine weeks, as I said, has to be the gap before you take the vaccine. You cannot bombard your system to fight out again when you're just uh, convalescing or recovering. So uh, two months is uh, uh, the time frame that you must allow yourself. Thank you. Okay, Thank what you, is the probability that I get infected, doctor? Okay. Uh, again, if you really take your vitamin D, zinc, hydrate yourself, mask yourself, wash your hands, uh, and uh, social distancing, that is the key. Very and all these simple things which I told about the maids and you know the, the touch points where you may not have paid attention to uh, and uh, it may be around you. That much preventionary precautions you take, then reinfection is really remote. But if you do have symptoms again, or if you don't have symptoms, but you um, you know you have a strange doubt, then all that you've got to do is your oxygenation monitoring with the pulse oximeter. So uh, the reinfection uh, for a you know any patient without any uh, diabetes, hypertension, etc., fully recovered. It's unlikely, but if you don't take precautions, then it is, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not easy to escape this virus. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Ashvika? Okay, I think you're wrong. Ashvika? Okay, uh, I think we'll move to uh, Malini then. Malini, will you unmute yourself and? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Hema. It was a very informative session. Uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. Um, one is uh, this. Sorry, sorry. Uh oh. oh. Uh, Malini has muted again. Malini uh, just unmuted. Malini, can you just please unmute yourself? Sorry. Yes. Uh, so, Doctor, I uh, thank you for the very informative session. I wanted to know uh, where the CRP, ILAs, D dimer test. I mean, is the patient supposed to do it, or when they get admitted, it is done for them? Uh, that's one thing. And when, if we have the patient has to do it, when do they have to do it? And second is if a person is asymptomatic, uh, but uh, is uh, you know is infected, he will not even know that he's infected in such that's a right. situation. Can he? Uh, what if what happens if he goes and takes a vaccine? Uh, that is, uh, you know, if it's asymptomatic and uh, not tested, uh, okay, uh, and if he has a contact who is somebody living in his own uh, home or the apartment. If they are infected, then even presuming that no symptoms are there, it's better to get the contact tracing in that bracket. It's better to get the test done because when it's positive, then you have to avoid the vaccination. You can also do a rapid antigen test and if so that is a that's another way of checking so if um, a rapid antigen uh, test will also give you a clue whether you can go ahead with the uh, vaccination uh, or not and the other question uh, Malini just uh, tell me that yeah the CRP, first, the CRP, huh, CRP okay so usually why I explain about all that is some of the volunteers may get the call where the patient will start telling this, that and the other and it makes no head nor tail. So okay. who has asked for the test also? We don't know. So we have to refer to the group of uh, doctors that we have and they will interpret it. But usually the doctors will ask for these tests because huh. if the uh, RT-PCR is not done, okay, but the symptoms are there which are suggestive, then huh. instead of doing a CT, uh, which is very dangerous in the uh, view of the fact that you may pick up more viral load from the same CT machine being used for so many infected patients. They will yeah, ask yeah. for these simple set of uh, blood tests. Okay, so in that, yes, there is a CRP, there is an IL-6, uh, there is the D-dimer, there is another simple thing called complete blood count, CBC. 
In that, they will see the ratio of uh, N and L, neutrophils and lymphocytes. Such a simple, like a KG class student, you know, if the doctor reads it also, he will know which way we are uh, moving. And based on that, based okay. on these parameters, the doctor will be able to institute the treatment early along the lines of presumed COVID-19 infection. And that is a big plus. That is where it stands. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Malini. Uh, Jyotsna, if you can just... Ashwika is, I think, unmuted now. Ashwika? Ashwika is unmuted, is it? Okay. Yeah, Ash Ashwika? No. Huh. Ashwika, I think there's a problem with... Okay. Uh, Ashwika, will you just, if you just sort out your microphone, by then, by that time, Jyotsna, I think, can just ask. Uh, Jitsna? Yes. Hello, doctor. Thank you so much for uh, such an informative session today. So uh, just a personal question. Since all of our family members are working from home for past one year and there has been absolutely no outside contact, like not even mates are coming in, should uh, asymptomatic people um, like us should also go through any test, especially like for my mother-in-law, her uh, oxygen level has been stable at 95. So hmm. what do you suggest, ma'am? No, see, if all the healthy people cannot be as a blanket considered as asymptomatic, but uh, likely to have COVID positive. That's not the way we look at it. You will definitely test if there are symptoms. And if you have a contact, you know, many are staying in the apartments. The next door apartment uh, person is having positive, then it's better that you get uh, tested if you're just, you know, next door, not in the next building. And also the maid is coming from five, six houses and then she reports that somebody in some house has tested positive. So they have not asked her to, they have asked her not to come for two weeks. If that's the kind of information your maid gives, then your maid is your contact. She has gone to that house. That house, some person has tested positive, and today she has come to your house also. No, ma'am. So, there have been no such maids for last one year. We have been doing ourselves. Yeah, but, then, uh, but yeah, like home deliveries and all we take and do sanitize regularly. Uh, yeah, then that is uh, then there is uh, really no need for uh, anybody and everybody rushing uh, for testing because uh, it doesn't come in any kind of eligibility bracket for testing because otherwise all the 1.3 billion people will have to test. No, yeah. Not, yeah. Thank you, yeah, ma'am. So, so just being at a safer side. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Uh, but Jotsa, thank you. Uh, congratulations to you for your commitment. Uh, and I can really palpate um, the way you feel for uh, the patients that you're handling. So my hat's off to you. And all all learning work. from seniors like you, ma'am. Thank yeah. you so much. And thanks goes to all the dedicated volunteers of BNP. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jyotsna. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, ma Ashwika. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, this is Ashwika's father, Ashok. I couldn't okay. rename it. My daughter's okay. uh, device. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much for the informative session. I could able to connect the dots. And it it is so helpful in uh, helping uh, patients in yeah. guiding and all. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, uh, one question. Mm -hmm. um, so Tamil Nadu government, so they they are suggesting Ayurvedic medicine, some kabasur kudinir. And mm -hmm. yesterday I could see the, there is a, a, a government which has released a letter to encourage Ayush sixty four and kabasur kudinir. Hmm. So, is there any harm uh, for patients uh, who are taking allopathic medicine uh, to take this Ayurvedic as well? Um, uh, allopathic medicines for COVID, if they take COVID, 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 yes, yes. Uh -huh. Then uh, maybe if they are selling it as Ayush uh, immunity booster, etc., which may not have a great evidence, but it is not going to um, uh, clash with uh, the allopathic uh, system. But uh, the true answer is, I'm sure that, uh, you know, the time will tell whether those will come to stay or not. The government oh. may have, uh, because, you know, there's also something called a faith healing. So <laughs> it is like the you know, patient is thinking that they're taking something, so it is boosting. So that morale, you know, that oh. Set of mind will definitely improve the immunity. That theory okay. is there. So 
So maybe indirectly it is helping in that we cannot discard anything just because we don't know what it is. But yeah. I'm quite sure that if all the parameters are improving mm. with the uh, known medication that the person is taking, mm -hmm. then they are well on their path to recovery. Just like the zinc and vitamin D, which has hopped uh, in the front line, that it will mm. boost immunity, boost immunity. We always knew that, but nobody was actually taking it on a regular basis because uh, everybody thought they will handle things by themselves. Now they're taking this supplement. Like that, mm -hmm. maybe this is also one of the supplements which will handle the immune system. Um, Got you, ma'am. So uh, the answer is like, so they can use it, ma'am, because it yes. will not clash with uh, this thing. Yeah, got you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. But they should use it uh, with the firm belief in their mind that they don't know whether that is really helping or not. If they think, oh, that I have got great immunity, I can go out without a mask, then no. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Romail, if you unmute yourself, please. Hey, hi. Thanks, Monica. Uh, thank you, doctor. That session was really, uh, really helpful. I had uh, largely uh, most of my questions were answered, but I still have three. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, uh, is there a daily regime that you can suggest that everyone follows uh, just to be on the protective side of things? Uh, uh, I think uh, Josna briefly touched upon that, but I just wanted to understand, is there a daily regime that, uh, you know, uh, we, we as individuals who think uh, I am not affected. I have not been in touch. Uh, I have uh, taken all the care uh, that we can, you know, this is just to detect the early signs. Uh, that's yeah. one. Mm. Number two is uh, when you say it's airborne, what is it that it exactly mean for a layman? Uh, and my third and last question is, is, is more on uh, preparation and fingers crossed it never comes. Uh, there are talks on, on the WhatsApp uh, groups about the third wave being intensive on children. I just wanted to understand whether that's uh, that's something that's uh, a reality or just a just a WhatsApp University product. Uh, that's okay. those are my three questions. Yeah, it's easy to start with your third question. So let me <laughs> tackle that first. Uh, COVID nineteen and its mutants are really fooling all of us because we don't know what's going to change and how it's going to change. There's a huge difference in the conduct of the COVID nineteen mutants. First wave is quite different, has been quite different from the second wave. All lessons that we learned from first wave are useless for the second wave. That is the scenario as on today. The prediction, the mathematical models that they do, they sit on the computers and do some programming and say that because of this, we expect this, this thing to happen. That is the, like an astrological prediction they're doing. But the COVID-19 virus is not sticking to any norms or rules. It does whatever it wants. So the predictability model, which they're saying, now the uh, second wave has affected lesser age group. That is like 30, 35, 40, 45. Even without comorbidities are losing their lives. So the modeling, the way it is going, they're saying that the third wave may affect again another elder age group. Which from elderly, it came to the midsection to the children. That is the thought process which is going on in the scientific world. But you never know that COVID may just fool us and it may not really come to the children or it may come to uh, everybody at one go. So being guarded, being cautious, that comes to your first question, which is the norm. Another couple of months, we are not going to escape. We are only thinking that because of the lockdown, we are following the rules. That is not going to get us anywhere. Lockdown or no lockdown, whether you're sure or there, we have to um, uh, do the distancing and the mask. That is inevitable, though it's such a pain. But that has to uh, stay. The precautions that you need to take is what we've been telling for the last whole year, right from the first wave, that don't stop the social distancing. Little one function, one birthday, my uh, child this and that, let's do it for a long time, we haven't met people. Please cut out all those uh, temptations because crowd will really trigger off. You don't know from where it's coming and when it's coming. So that has to be social events have to be strictly avoided. Then the parcels coming to your house, so just let them leave it at the door and then you just uh, take it. So face to face, you must not meet that person. Please uh, make sure that your maid, however uncomfortable she is or the cook, she will wear the mask. And you also, if anybody at home is infected, then you have to maintain a distance. But even otherwise, 
generally maintaining a distance like while watching television if people can sit there on uh, that distance because you never know which member has gone out for what and the come maybe he just gone to the next door medical store and come and so you just need to play safe on uh, all of that just be guarded till we know more about uh, this and the mid question which you asked about airborne what it means initially they said that it is not airborne because the particles of the covid 19 virus were heavy So they said when somebody talks loudly or spits or coughs, okay, the virus will go and it will drop down on the floor within a short distance of two feet. So if you are standing at three feet, the virus is coming out of my mouth, but it is stopping short in two feet and falling on the ground. So if you are at a three feet distance. it will not run from uh, you know 3 feet distance it will not run and it will not infect you or affect you okay that is the whole purpose of it is double masking also which nowadays we are recommending but right. now the recent things is the way it is spreading like wildfire you are maintaining distance but still it is coming you are somebody is at home presuming that you know um, uh, they are taking the best of the care still it's coming so that means it is in the air you know it is the mutants are lighter particles which are not falling down at 2 feet which are just generally that is why they always say open the windows and or even when you are self isolating because cross ventilation should be there air which is infected should move out and the fresh air should come in etc etc so you double mask but uh, you can stand at the window where the window or the balcony needs to be i mean there you can uh, breathe some air but uh, through your mask so air cone means that uh, anybody potentially at any distance is likely to uh, get uh, cross infected from one and uh, another that uh, heavy particle size uh, of the covid uh, is not existent in the mutant form that is why we really really don't know uh, the answer to the question what the future holds all right great uh, shri devi i think we'll just take the last two three questions and close at 11 is that okay dr hema <laughs> yeah yeah okay yeah Uh, madam uh, can feeding mothers take vaccination because my house helps daughter in law is a feeding mother the baby is only 4 5 months old so when she gets her turn can she take the vaccination um actually the government recommendation as yet is that uh, vaccine should not be given to uh, pregnancy um, and lactating uh, mothers even yesterday they released a very strong and a strict uh, guideline that uh, we don't have indian data on the pregnant and lactating mothers so professional uh, are um, being told by the government guidelines and dictate uh, if you may say that we should not give it to pregnant and lactating mothers though all the other organizations in the world and the world bodies have recommended that yes you can get if you are in israel or if you are in uk or if you are in us they are giving to the pregnant and lactating mothers because the mother has to be protected primarily that is the uh, intent it's a matter of her human right that she cannot get sick and lose her life just because she's lactating and she's been denied of the vaccine that is their thought process but i guess our government will you know, maybe in another 6 months they will release the guideline because if they say for pregnant and lactating mothers um, shri devi there are 30 million pregnant women every year in our country and an equal number therefore of lactating women so we will need 60 million doses extra which we don't have now so they are bit hesitant to release the guideline as of now that is the truth of the matter so but if she has crossed 6 uh, months of exclusive breastfeeding maybe in another 2 months time she will get over that uh, you know phase of exclusive breastfeeding the child is on breastfeeding but all the other then she is not into courts considered as a lactating mother she has finished her pregnancy she has finished her fe uh, exclusive feeding phase now she becomes eligible as any other general citizen to get the jab and then yeah we can give it to her Okay, great. Thanks. Last question, Doctor uh, Kiran. <laughs> Kiran, if you just unmute and yeah. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Thank um, you. Um, uh, my sister-in-law actually came down with COVID, and uh, she became critically ill. Uh, she got admitted uh, to the ICU and was on ventilator. So while when she was in the ventilator, I actually visited her in the ICU. With the, all the PPE kit, double masking, face shield, and all the required uh, measures. So four days I visited her, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, now actually it is uh, she. Uh, I visited last year uh, on thirtieth April. Yeah. So it's nearly ten days, uh, eight days since I visited the ICU. But I'm a little uh, apprehensive because I stay with my uh, aged parents, and uh, my husband is diabetic. So I sort of uh, uh, in quarantine. I can't say it is hundred percent, but uh, yeah. I'm trying to stay away from them. I'm masking when I'm going out. I mask up and uh, go out. So. And also, I've taken my first dose, and uh, I'm due for the second one. <laughs> Six weeks since I've taken my first dose. So yeah, I just so two quick me. questions, Kiran, to you. Um, your age, and uh, if you can reveal <laughs> your age mm-hmm. and uh, your status of diabetes, hypertension, etc. No, I don't have any comorbidities. I'm forty-six. Yeah. So um, whatever you're doing uh, now is uh, very appropriate and you must um, continue that. And I'm happy that you've taken the first and, uh, um, you know, whenever you, uh, you're on the COVID list, and, uh, you're eligible for the second job, please go ahead and uh, have that as well. And if you have any symptoms whatsoever, you run okay. for- if you have uh, loss of uh, smell and uh, taste and uh, if you have cough and if you have uh, giddiness or uh, drowsiness, any small suspicion of any single symptom, then you have to please go for the RT-PCR test. Okay. But it looks like, uh, you know, you, um, and you are unlikely to have that also because luckily you've taken the first jab, which is really, believe me, 70-80% protective already and uh, you've been sensible enough to carry um, uh, to continue the precautions uh, in the manner that you've just explained, which is uh, excellent, brilliant. Sorry. Uh, you know, there was again another question about nebulization at home. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think <laughs> uh, is, yeah. that has to be under doctor's supervision because that yeah. steroids at a wrong time can cause more harm than uh, uh, can uh, cause more harm than use. Okay, yeah, there's yeah. also somebody who has written that oxygen cylinders in the school buses we can carry here and there. Um, but again, um, you know, if it is stationed in an apartment complex, it is easier. But home to home when you carry, okay, you can carry and give it there. But who is monitoring? Yeah. The patient yeah. who is on oxygen is a bit of a problem. So another uh, good compromise will be if they can afford it, they must hook on to the a uh, hotel stay where the nurse monitoring will be um, there for sure. But if uh, at their own home, they can teleconsult the doctor. That's yeah. also. Yeah. But you can only take the responsibility of the supply. But you must make sure that they take the responsibility of connecting with their doctors for yeah. the other. Hmm. Otherwise, if they, you know, um, it will be a... Yeah, it will not be the right thing to do. Yeah. A lot of people were asking yesterday and today also for those who are living in independent homes, not in apartments... Can per, should perfectly healthy and fit people get a concentrator at home in advance just in case? Uh, you know, it is quite expensive. It is about 55 uh, to 60. Um, yeah, 55 to 60,000. Uh, yeah. What's that? Sorry, is that? Okay, it is muted. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I, I was I was just toying with the idea that if groups like BNP can, you know, collectively source um, uh, some, and then uh, it can be available on rentals on a telecall. That would be a better way of, uh, you know, kind of. But if they have uh, the bandwidth to buy the oxygen concentrators, mm. uh, they must actually ideally, uh, you know, uh, lend it to people who need it, and then. Yeah. Uh, get it back when they themselves need it. That will be a worthwhile investment for those who can afford. They'll be helping others also. That's absolutely. The, yeah. Absolutely, Doctor. Thank you so much. I think we have now run out of time. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have may, I've, What we'll do is that the questions that we haven't answered, we'll just make a note of it or perhaps we can just uh, put it up as an FAQ somewhere and maybe do this session again sometime next week yeah the handbook doctor. handbook version two uh, handbook version two yeah, yeah. Uh, monica can i suggest that uh, anybody having questions can please post it on the group also yeah it can be compiled and uh, sandhya can compile it and send to dr yeah. Hemant, monica, and then it can be answered yes yeah yeah so sandhya just uh, copy all the questions that are there in the chat and 
ಮಾಲಿನಿ Thanks. Yeah, so congratulations to BNP team again for their enthusiasm and their commitment and uh, uh, we will definitely uh, collaborate to do our best from our end too. <laughs> Namaskar. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.